Kia ora, I'm Simon Hampton. Welcome in to Kiwis Abroad on Sky Sport, where we take an in-depth look at the Kiwi athletes plying their trade around the world. On today's show, Winston Reid is back at West Ham, but nowhere to be seen in their match day squad. We get the inside word from a local reporter in London, Roshane Thomas. But first, the coronavirus pandemic is leaving its mark on the Australian Tennis Open. 72 players are in a hard quarantine in Melbourne after a positive case was found on their flight into Australia recently. Among them, Kiwi tennis players Artem Sitak and Marcus Daniel. Well, Marcus Daniel joins me now on Kiwis Abroad to tell us about life in quarantine. Marcus, thanks so much for your time. How's it going in there? It's uh, pretty monotonous. You know, I'm, I'm doing the same things every day, seeing the same things every day. And uh, that's by design a little bit. I'm trying to get myself into a routine where, you know, I, I wake up reasonably early in the morning and, and try and have a purpose to get myself out of bed. Uh, but, you know, it's I, I can't really complain. The, the room's nice. I'm, I'm comfortable. We've been delivered a little bit of fitness equipment, so doing my best to, to stay conditioned. And, yeah, I think I've got about eight or eight days or so to go. Yeah, nice. And I understand uh, you have a window that opens a little bit that, that some other players don't have. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one benefit that we've got as doubles players. It's sort of topsy-turvy. Usually the doubles players get put in the worst rooms. And we are in sort of the third tier hotel compared to the singles guys. But one of the one of the great things here is we do get to open our windows a crack. And um, yeah, that, that little breath of, breath of fresh air uh, when you're two weeks in a hotel room is a lifesaver. But it's a, it's a view across uh, the cricket ground to the practice courts, which I imagine is sort of a bit tough mentally, knowing that you're so close yet, yet so far away. Yeah, it's that's that's a really difficult part of it. So, you know, I'm seeing all of my opponents go out and, and practice and get their five hours of training in, and I'm stuck in the hotel room. So, you know, I'm sort of standing in the window and trying to shadow play against them and, and you know, like will the neurons in my arms to start firing. Uh, and I see a lot of them, you know, they, they walk back to the hotel and I guess they can see us in the windows and my doubles partner's right next door to me. So I think... They see us standing in the windows looking out longingly and, and a bunch of them have laughed. So, you know, we're, we're taking it in our stride as best as we can, trying to stay in high spirits and uh, just focusing on being as ready as we can be when we come out. So it's a pretty strict quarantine, right? What can and can't you do? It's extremely strict. Um, we, we can't leave the room. Uh, you know, uh, meals get dropped outside the door. We can't have our door open too quickly to grab them. You know, it's just like pull the door ajar, snake an arm out, pull it back into the room, and, and then that's that. Um, and that's it for two weeks. Uh, and, you know, I, I really understand why they're so strict here. They um, they had a really hard time of it last year. Uh, they went through hell to get to a stage where, you know, they could live a normal life in Melbourne, and they will do anything not to let it get back to a lockdown. And, I get that. It's just, um, yeah, it's it's hard when you're in it. So you've been pretty busy lately launching this uh, this charity, High uh, Impact Athletes. So I imagine you, you've got plenty on your plate to keep you busy through this quarantine? That's actually been a godsend, yeah. Um, I think I'm really lucky because uh, I can, you know, schedule a bunch of calls for reasonably early in the morning, get out of bed and sort of go, go straight to work. And uh, I have been keeping myself super busy and it has been making the days pass a lot quicker. Uh, I did hear a story the other day that there's one player who came in on the flight that was affected from Doha who only has a cell phone. He doesn't have a computer. He doesn't have books. He doesn't have an iPad. Um, and that, that would be tough. You know, just the only entertainment you have is your own thoughts or a little cell phone screen. So I actually consider myself pretty lucky at the moment. Yeah, nice. And, and what about uh, tennis activities? How, how do you keep busy? Obviously, it's, it's pretty tough when you can't leave the room, but I just saw some videos on social media of players you know, hitting balls against the wall of their hotel room to try and keep as active as they possibly can. What have you been uh, doing uh, with your tennis stuff? Yeah, there's been a bit of that. Um, I'll show you. I do have a mattress leaned up against the wall there. That's my, uh, that's my rebound board. So I'm, I'm following against that as much as I can, just trying to put whatever repetition through the arm that I can. Um, I've got a mat down on the floor here. I've got a little exercise bike. Um, and for weights, they've they've been dropping off these sort of pallets of, of bottled water. So I've been sort of 
you know, throwing them around as weights and just getting creative about it. Um, you know, it's, it definitely doesn't compare to any time on a tennis court. It's, uh, you take it for granted how, um, how you stay fit as a tennis player, but really there's no substitute for, for being on a tennis court and having a ball coming at you at a couple of hundred K an hour. So both, we, we were actually talking about it earlier today, my doubles partner and I, with our coach here, that we're going to have to be really careful on the other side coming out that we don't try and overcompensate for two weeks of not training and uh, actually ease our bodies back in because I think that's where the injury risk is. Yeah, I was just going to ask that next. How does this affect your, your preparation for the, the tournament itself? It's about as it's about as bad preparation as you could possibly ask for. Uh, you know, if you're not hitting tennis balls, you, you can't stay in shape. That's the bottom line. Uh, unfortunately, there's there's just no substitute for hitting tennis balls. So you know, we're going to be doing the best we can do. We're gonna we're gonna try and keep our lung capacity as high as we can. Try and keep our muscles working. You know, put as much weight as we can through it. But at the end of the day, it's going to take us. You know, at least a few days to get back to a stage where hitting a tennis ball feels comfortable again. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, there's been some headlines um, around how some of the other players have reacted to this quarantine. Novak Djokovic, uh, the most high profile with his proposal um, or his list of proposals, I guess, uh, to better the quarantine. Uh, among them, better food, shortening the period if you can get a negative test. And I think the most outlandish was moving players to, to private houses with tennis courts. What's uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on Novak's ideas there? Yeah, I spoke out about this a little bit uh, yesterday. I, I'm a little frustrated by that list. Uh, I really think it puts it puts this whole situation backwards a step. Uh, you know, I think it's a reasonable request to ask for a bit of food. Um, we are professional athletes. We are trying to prepare for one of the most important tournaments of our year. Uh, and we, we can't do that uh, if we don't have good enough food. So, you know, I, I do think it's a reasonable request. But when you surround a request like that with asking to be transferred to private houses or, you know, not going through the full period of quarantine, why would anyone take a reasonable request seriously? Uh, so yeah, I was I was really frustrated when I saw that list. Um, I think it's always been extremely clear that we were going to have to go through two weeks of unideal situation. I think we were very lucky that the the Australian government or the Victorian government allowed Tennis Australia and allowed this tournament to give us five hours of practice. Um, obviously there are now 72 of us in the position where that's been taken away and that sucks you know there, there's no getting around it but um, yeah I've been, I've been a little annoyed that the players who are able to practice are able to get outside and, and do at least a bit of preparation for the tournament have been complaining so much when most of those of us who are in the really hard quarantine are just sort of gritting our teeth and getting through it um, but as always, it's the vocal minority that get heard, and I really do. I think they're they're making a bad name for for the Australian Open and and for tennis in general. You know, we we don't want to be considered as entitled wingers, and the reality is that the majority aren't. But uh, that's not what gets seen. That was going to be uh, the, the next question as well. Do you think this is just the vo vocal minority, and and you you speak with other players? Um, that are in the hard quarantine or, or in the softer quarantine and, and, and is the, the sentiment e echoed that, that they're kind of disappointed with, with these, uh, these comments from other players? Yes, that's, that's been the feeling that I've had. Uh, everyone is frustrated and very understandably so. I do think that Tennis Australia could have been much better at communicating what the worst case scenario would be and communicating what sort of chance that had to happen because the way I see it now is the chances of this happening were reasonably high. You know, they, they were, it was definitely a possibility that out of 17 flights coming into the country, at least one of them would be, uh, have one case on it. And I can say from my point of view, and this might be my own fault, but I can say that I wasn't under the impression that if there was one positive case on a flight, that the whole flight would be quarantined. So I think there's some legitimate frustration on the player side around that. I think there's some legitimate frustration on the player side that uh, everyone was shut up in their rooms for the first three or four days, and the information that we was get we were given uh, originally was that we would be able to practice after our first negative test. 
Um, so there are some things that I think weren't communicated, but mitigating that, you know, Tennis Australia haven't been able to practice for this. This is, this is a crazy situation. They've done an incredible job just getting us here, an incredible job organizing all of the log logistics of this whole operation. And there are going to be some things that slip through, through the cracks. So you know, I just think it's a really tough situation. I understand the frustration from the player side. I understand why people in Melbourne are just telling people to shut up and, and get on with it because they've been through worse. And right in the middle of that is Tennis Australia just taking it from both sides. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel for them. Have you at all, you know, I, I don't know about regret, but but I guess have you at times re thought about whether you should have come down to the Australian Open um, after going through this process? For me, it's, it's still a no-brainer. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be locked in a hotel room for two weeks, but... After, we're, after we've done these two weeks, if, if we're negative, then we're going to go out into Melbourne, beautiful city. We're going to live normal life, which for most of us is going to be the first time in you know close to a year. Uh, I'm going to be able to go out and, and sit at a cafe and have one of the world-class coffees that they have around here. And we're going to be, be able to play tennis in front of a crowd. Um, for me, even if I'd known that I would have had to go through a, a hard two-week quarantine, I think the pros outweigh the cons. and I really hope that, uh, you know, once everyone's out and everyone's playing tennis, I hope that the joy of competing in front of people really outweighs the, the misery that a few people have gone through uh, during these two weeks. You, you touched on going to cafes. Uh, you've you've been, spent a lot of time in Europe and, and the US, two uh, areas pretty hard hit by, by the coronavirus. So, you know, cafes, what else are you, are you looking forward to, to doing when, when you're out on the outside? Uh, apart from playing tennis as well, but uh, do you think it'll be a sort of surreal feeling um, going back into a, a normal lifestyle? Definitely, for, to begin with. One thing that really struck me was after I went through the New Zealand quarantine, about two days after we got out, I just completely forgot about COVID. Uh, and, and that was a beautiful thing, you know, to, to not sort of walk around with low-grade fear with everything you do. Um, so I'm hoping that the same happens here, that, you know, for the first sort of couple of days, two or three days after we get out of quarantine, we're a little shell shock. And, you know, if you see someone that, without a mask, your first reaction is to sort of walk away. But uh, I'm hoping that after that, it's just going to be, you know, even it's going to be the first time that I've interacted normally with other tennis players uh, in over half a year. Um, so it's not just, you know, the cafe that I can sit at. It's also this community that I've that I'm a part of and that, usually there's pretty close interaction. I haven't seen people's faces for a long time because we've just all been hidden behind masks. So, yeah, I think it's going to be lovely. I think um, once we get out of here, we're all going to have a great time. It's going to be summer in Melbourne. And, uh, you know, the, the Australian Open has said, we understand these two weeks are going to be rough. And when you're out, we're, we're really going to go overboard to, to put on an amazing slam for you. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and I, I guess it's one of those events that, that you know, the world will be, will be watching. Um, they always are, and particularly uh, when there's not much sport going on with crowds around the world. So uh, the chance to play in front of fans again must, must be very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's obviously more special than the other slams in, in at least one way because this is what I sort of consider my home slam, being, being a Kiwi. Uh, and there's a, a decent Kiwi contingent in Melbourne. So, you know, I'm really hoping that for the first time in a long time, I can play in, some, in front of some friends. Um, and, you know, that's that's one of the things that makes playing sport special is entertaining and, um, you know, feeling the emotions and the reactions of a crowd. We haven't had it for a long time, and, and I think everyone's really going to enjoy it. Just uh, finally, beyond the Australian Open, what are your plans for the next few months? Uh, are, you, are you in a position yet to, yet to make firm plans? Uh, well, what we've learned over the last six months or so, or, or even longer, is that in these times, plans are just extremely fluid. Uh, and so we, we, have a, we have a plan. We're going to go to Europe and play. There are three events over there that we're going to play in, in France and the Netherlands. Uh, and then there's going to be a build-up tournament either in Dubai or Acapulco before going back to the States for the Masters in Miami. That's the plan. You know, um, I hope that goes ahead. Uh, but at the moment, we're just trying to sort of stay loose and, and not put too much expectation on anything because things change at the drop of a hat. Hey, well, thanks very much for, for coming on and, and 
talking to me today um, and, and best of luck for the Australian Open when you, when you do get out. Um, obviously, it will be tough prep for you, but you know, fingers crossed you can uh, have a good run. Thanks a lot. No, I appreciate the chat. It's, um, it's always helpful to, to see faces when you're in a hotel room by yourself. All right, Marcus Daniel there. Those players due out of quarantine on the 29th of January. The Australian Open due to start on the February the 8th. Uh, so not a short period of time for those players to get themselves up to speed before the first tennis major of the year. And all the action at the Australian Open will, of course, be on Sky Sport. Well, a raft of injuries means it's been some three years since all white skipper Winston Reid suited up for West Ham. But a successful loan spell at Sporting Kansas City in the US last year uh, had some hoping that he'd be able to force his way back into the English Premier League side. That hasn't been the case, though, since returning this month. And to give us some inside info into what the latest is with Winston Reid, Rashane Thomas from The Athletic joins me now on Kiwis Abroad. Rashane, thanks for coming on. What is Winston's status at West Ham at the moment? The latest on his status is uh, he's currently training with the first team at West Ham. So technically, he's still a West Ham player. Uh, sporting Kansas City, they tried to make it a permanent, but because of Winston Reid's wage demands, he wasn't able to get the deal over the line. And also, while Winston Reid was on loan at Kansas City, he was away from his wife and two young kids. So it wasn't really practical in terms of making that move permanent. So, yeah, right now, he's still a West Ham player, but it's going to be a bit hard for him to get in the first team. He's like the sixth-choice centre-half right now at West Ham. He's behind the likes so of Craig Dawson, Angela Bonner, uh, Issa Diop, Harvey Marbrino. And also, West Ham's only signing so far this window has been a young Danish defender called Frederick Alves. So there's a lot of players ahead of him, unfortunately. So, is, is there any chance, do you think, that, that he could get some, some game time over the next uh, over the back half of the season? I think the only chance of Winston Reid getting game time is there to be injuries. Because that centre-half right now is West Ham's song strongest position. They have like seven or six centre-halves. There's just so many, well, that's including Winston Reid. So it's going to be hard for him to get game time. Right now, West Ham are still involved in the FA Cup. And I imagine Moyes will be doing a lot of rotation. So possibly a place on the bench and coming for the last 10 minutes or so. That could be a possibility. But in terms of like Winston Reid and his future, I reckon a long spell would be more ideal. He still has two years left on his on his current contract. He signed a six-year deal in March 2015, and that got extended in uh, August 2017. So right now, his current deal is expires at the end of the 2022-2023 season. So in terms of Winston Reid and his future, he's in a comfortable place. You've got to think about money after his playing career. So right now, he holds the cards in terms of his playing career. It's just a case of, Unfortunately, not much game time at West Ham. So West Ham must surely be regretting that contract because I, I think that's quite big wages for Winston and, uh, yeah. as you say, through until 2023. So that's quite a hard contract to move, isn't it? It is, but there's two ways of looking at it. At the time, Winston Reid was one of the best defenders in the Premier League, in my opinion. He was like really up there. And I wrote a piece recently just reflecting on his time at West Ham and what next. And that's sort of based on the fact that if you're a boxer, right, and you're the best in your weight class, Everyone wants to come and try and take your place. And rightfully, you get the chance to defend your title and prove you're the best. Unfortunately for Winston, he wasn't given that chance to defend his title because he suffered that injury, that horrible injury. So players were coming and taking his place and he, he didn't get the chance to say, you know what, I'm the best. Like, you can't get my place. So, and you know what, March, in two months' time, in fact, it'll be three years since Winston Reid last played competitive football for West Ham. That's how long it would have been, so... The club will be regretting it, but at the time it was a good contract because, as I mentioned, he's one of the best players in, the, in well, one of the best event defenders in the Premier League. Yeah, is there a sense of, of what the options might, uh, of what options there might be out there for him, uh, a loan move in England or, or back overseas yeah. again? Well, there was interest from a uh, MLS side, Nashville. There was interest on in them taking him on loan again, but right now I spoke to those close to Winston Reid, and they're saying, listen, he's still happy with the situation. He's still a West Ham player, he still has two years on his current deal. So right now, he's happy with how, how things are. And obviously, the good thing about his loan spell at Kansas City, he proved his over the injury. Yes, he's not the winner to beforehand, but he can still do a job. He can still contribute towards the team. He can still be that leader, that good presence in the dressing room. He's 32 right now, so he is approaching the sort of twilight of his career. But if you were to join a club on loan in England, I feel like he still has to do a good job. So, I mean, as you say, the, the family's important for Winston and, and there's no sense then that he's going to try and force a move away. He's, he's quite happy to, to bide his time. Hope, hope maybe there might be some injuries and he can get a run with West Ham, but he's not going to try and force a move away from the club. Yeah, not at all. And 
I think right now it'll sort of be smart for Winston and me to just wait another six months and reevaluate things in the summer when you know we'll know a bit more about the future. Let's say David Moyes and if he'll be given a long term contract, if the likes of Fabio Marbena will commit an, a new deal because his current contract ex expires at the end of the season. So there's a lot of things to weigh up in terms of like whether it'll be more ideal for Winston to stay or just be like, you know what, I've been here for the best part of what, 10 years now, had great times. It's time for me to, you know, go for passes new and try try my luck elsewhere. But as I mentioned, 32, in my opinion, still a good defender, can still have a meaningful impact somewhere else. So the whole narrative that Winston really is finished or he's not a good defender, that is not true. But he's still a good defender, just needs a bit of game time to, you know, prove himself again. Is there uh, a sense from the fans that they still love him? Obviously, he's a bit of a, a cult figure. He's, he's played there yeah. for, for almost 10 years, as you say. He scored that last goal at Upton Park. Uh, so he was always a fan favourite, but he also hasn't played for, for three years. Do the yeah. fans still love him? Oh, 100%. Fans still love him. Fans still have the opinion that he deserves a testimonial, given how long he's been at the club. And the whole thing is just unfortunate due to that injury he suffered at Swansea City. Had he not suffered that injury, in my opinion, when Stewie was still being the first team right now at West Ham, he'll be thriving on David Moyes, who'll have a great partnership with Ogbonna. I mean, can you imagine that? Ogbonna and, and Rich to read and defence, that, that'll be incredible. Worthy we'll of West Ham Championship for top six place, in my opinion. So, fans will still love him. But it's not as if Winston Reed has been like, I want to leave the club or been disrespectful to fans. It's just a case where he suffered an unfortunate injury, took him a while to recover. And, you know, with football, you've got to move on. So players are coming and taking his place. But yeah, fans still love him. And yeah, they, they wanted to come back. But unfortunately, I don't, I don't see it happening anytime soon. All right. Thanks so much for coming on the show, mate. Really appreciate your insight into to the goings on at West Ham. No worries at all. Thanks for having me on. Rashane Thomas out of the Athletic there. Certainly be big to get Winston Reid back on the field and playing regularly. He's such a crucial part of the All Whites and going into this year when World Cup qualifiers are scheduled to begin. Uh, it, it'll be very important to have uh, the Kiwi skipper back on the field. All right, that wraps up today's episode of Kiwis Abroad. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. I'll be back Wednesday night with another episode. Until then, take care.